Turn with me in your Bible this morning to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. Good to see a good number here this morning. Already mentioned the Lord's given us a pretty day to be here. If you're visiting with us today, we're thankful to have you. Hope you'll feel welcome. Jeremiah chapter 29. We'll give you just a little bit of background information before I read in this chapter. Uh, we know that following the reign of King Solomon, that the nation of Israel was divided. There were ten northern tribes that kept the name Israel, and their capital was in Samaria. There were two southern tribes. They took the name Judah. Their capital was in Jerusalem. And that both of those kingdoms fell to foreign adversaries in the years following the division. The Assyrians would come in and they would overthrow the ten northern tribes in 722 B.C. They would carry the people into Assyria and they took many of the Assyrian people and they brought them back to Israel. And uh, in an attempt to assimilate the, uh, the Israelites to Assyrian culture, and that's where the Samaritans came from that you find in the New Testament, was that those mixed peoples, part Jew, part Gentile. The two southern tribes continued on for around another 140 years or so until 586 B.C., Jerusalem fell. It was at that time that Nebuchadnezzar came in. They besieged the city. That went on for a couple of years. And uh, finally, when Jerusalem was basically starved out, that they went in, they tore the walls down, they destroyed the temple, they carried out the gold, the silver, and those precious things, and Jerusalem was left in ruin. And of course, the, the book of Nehemiah tells us about a time period after that when Nehemiah would be concerned about Jerusalem. Of course, they'd begin to rebuild the walls. But what I'm going to read you this morning here in, in Jeremiah chapter uh, 29 is around the period of time in which Jerusalem fell. And let me explain it this way. The fall of Jerusalem didn't happen overnight and it didn't happen suddenly. Over about a 20 year period of time, and I want you to understand this because it's going to be important as we look at this. Over about a 20 year period of time, there were basically three different deportations of Israelites out of Jerusalem to Babylon. You remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't leave in 586 B.C. They weren't there when, when Jerusalem was trodden down of the Gentiles. They left in the first wave that was somewhere, 602 or somewhere around in there. I might not have the year exactly right. But it was about 20 years before that Jerusalem was finally destroyed, they were taken out. And Nebuchadnezzar, he did this very methodically. You see, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were some of the brightest, weren't they? So he began by taking out some of the brightest. What we're going to read about here in Jeremiah 29, this is the second group that were taken out of Jerusalem, that were exiled between uh, 602 and, and 586. I don't know the exact date in which it, it occurred, but you're going to find here this was some of the craftsmen, some of the smiths, some of the people that could build weapons and tools that Nebuchadnezzar took them out next. And that would certainly leave Jerusalem, you know, less likely to be able to defend themselves. And then, of course, the third exile, with not many left that time, most of those people were killed in 586 B.C. Jeremiah is going to send a letter, and that's what we're going to read this morning here in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah is going to send a letter to, the, to the, some of those people that were taken in that second captivity, in that second exile that took place from Jerusalem. And he's going to give them some instruction about how to live, what to do, in light of their current situation. So let's read, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to read down about 14 verses here. The, the, this whole chapter... Is, uh, is, is, is this letter that, that uh, Jeremiah is going to send. It's from God. It's not just from Jeremiah, but it's from God. But let's just read the first part of it. For the, I think it should be enough for the thought. It's my heart this morning. 
It says, now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue, the word residue means the remainder, of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests and to the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So you see here some of the people that he took away in this second uh, exile. Not only was it craftsmen and smiths, but it was priests, it was elders, it was people who led them religiously. Verse 2, after that Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. By the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent unto Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me when, you shall, when ye shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. And that's reading down through the first 14 verses uh, of this chapter. Now, of course, what we see here is the people of God. They're dwelling in a foreign land. These are God's people. And yet they've been taken captive uh, into Babylon. And it's a new experience for them. Uh, it's, it's unlike anything that they've ever been through. It's, there's a lot of uncertainty that they have. And there's some questions that they evidently were pondering on and were wondering about that they didn't have answers to. And some of those questions were these. First of all, how long are we going to be here? How long will we stay here? How are we supposed to act while we're here? What are we supposed to do? They didn't know. They were getting some conflicting uh, messages from the prophets that were among them. And you'll notice beginning in verse 8, that, uh, that the Lord, as He's speaking through Jeremiah, He tells them, don't you be listening to these false prophets. So, you know, they're telling you that they, they're dreaming dreams and they're prophesying falsely unto you, saying that I have sent them. And uh, basically they were telling the people that this captivity is not going to last long at all. That just hold your horses, just hang on, don't settle in, don't settle down. Uh, God's going to come and He's going to deliver us and, and uh, we're not going to be here very long. You can go back into some of the previous chapters and uh, you find Jeremiah uh, makes a statement that these false prophets were telling them, don't submit yourself to the, to the authorities. Don't submit yourself to the rulers. That uh, you do everything that, that you can to try to disrupt uh, things uh, where you are. And so with, with that advice that was given them, that they were basically just hanging out. And they were not doing anything. They were not trying to do anything to make things better 
in the situation that they were in. But notice the instructions that God gave them through Jeremiah. He told them, he said, you build houses, you plant gardens, uh, you start families, you have children, you seek the well-being uh, of your land. And he said that it's not going to be it's not going to be permanent here. He said, you're going to be here a while. He said, 70 years must be accomplished at Babylon. And he said, then I will visit you. And some wonderful statements that the Lord made unto them. Uh, that's why I went ahead and read on through, down through verse 11 and 13 and, and 14. Some wonderful promises that God gave them uh, that uh, I think that we can arrest in those promises today uh, as well. But he said that there will come a time I'll deliver you out of this place. Now, for a few minutes this morning, having looked at that and, and tried to lay that foundation, I'm going to preach, I guess just a, a thought, I've never tried to preach on this before, but it's what the Lord's laid on my heart, and uh, the thought that I want to use this morning is this, how to live in light of the times that we're living in. How do we live in light of the times that we're living in? How are we to live? What are we to do? How are we to act? What should be our attitude uh, toward the times that we're in? I believe this morning that as believers, we're in a very similar situation to what these people are in. Can you see that? Do you see the similarity here? They were in a situation where they were, they were in a strange land. They were, they were strangers here. They were, they were foreigners there. They didn't, they didn't know the customs of the land. They didn't like the customs of the land. They didn't care for the rulers that they had uh, in the land. Just, they didn't understand the language of the land. There were just so many things that were unfamiliar to them. So many things that they just really didn't know what to do in so many areas. And Brother Wilford, that's about the way that we are today, isn't it, as God's people? This land... And I'm glad we sung God Bless America this morning. I know we usually sing it every Sunday. I love this land. I'm so thankful to live in this land. But the America of today is different from the America when I was a kid. Things have changed. Our society is different. Our, our world is different. Uh, people's morals are different. People's standards are different. The truth is not different, but people interpret the truth differently than they did at one time. And so in a lot of ways, that we're in a situation similar to these people, to the situation that they were in. They, they're living in a foreign land. And also like them, Brother Adrian, we've been promised deliverance from this, haven't we? You know, the Bible says that when a saint of God closes their eyes in death, that they find rest. And that's one way that we can be delivered from this evil world is through death, if you know the Lord. But we also know that the Lord's coming back. He's promised us that He's coming back. John chapter 14, I'm not going to go, turn over and read those. Brother Steve mentioned that in our, our uh, Sunday school lesson this morning, that, that Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place, and I'm going to come back and get you. When he ascended back into heaven, that the angel stood there, he said, Why stand ye gazing into heaven? The same Jesus that went away in like manner that he's coming back. So we know he's coming back. He's going to deliver us. He's going to take us out of here. The rapture is going to occur. But what are we to do until then? What do we know is going to happen before the Lord comes back? We know the world's going to get worse and worse and worse. Do you believe that we'll experience revival before the Lord comes back? I hope we do here. In, 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 in this community, in this church, we can experience revival. Sure we can. But I don't look for some worldwide revival to take place. The Bible says that things will grow progressively worse until the coming of the Lord. And I know you have ups and downs even in that, but on the whole, it's going to get worse and worse and worse until He comes back. So knowing that, what should we do? What should we do? Should we just sit around and wait on Him to come back? Should we quit planning for the future? Should we cash in our retirement? 
What should we do? I think that's a pertinent question to you this morning. You think that's a pertinent question? What should we do? How should we live in a lot of the times that we're in? That's what they ask. What, what do we do? We're, we're over here in Babylon. We're over here in this place that's, that, that's strange to us. What should we do? What the Lord is going to try to get across to them is this. You need to make the best out of a bad situation that you're in. And I believe that's what we're to do today. We're, we're to try to make the best out of a bad situation that we're in in this world. And there's several thoughts that I want to take out of this passage. I'm, I'm just going to stay real close to this uh, text that we read this morning. But how are we to live in a lot of the times that we're in? What are we to do? Go back to verse 4 if you still have your Bible open. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4. I want to take several thoughts out of this. Notice the statement that the Lord is going to make to them first. Before He gives them the instructions, before He tells them what to do, He's going to lay a foundation. He said this in verse 4. Thus saith the Lord God, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. And I want to look at that statement for just a minute. First of all, before the Lord told them what to do, He first of all told them, I have caused this. I have caused this. Now let me ask you this. Was it the Lord's will for them to go into captivity in Babylon? It was not at all. It was His will for them to be obedient to Him, to, for them to stay in the land, to eat the good of the land, for them to look to Him and serve Him. But He told them, He said, if you don't, he said, these things are going to happen. You're going to go into captivity. And so that the Lord says, I have caused this. Or we would say it like this, I have allowed this. I have allowed this. So the first thing before He gave them any instructions, the Lord wanted them to know very plainly, I have allowed this to come to pass. These things have happened because I have allowed it. And basically, Brother Matt, what he was saying was, you need to accept it. You need to accept it, that these things have come your way. In other words, of what God was saying, I'm working my perfect plan, that I am doing this for your good. I am doing this in the long run for your benefit. This is something that's necessary in your lives. And so, in, in, in essence, that Brother Rodney, what God was saying you can whine about it, you can complain about it, you can be bitter about it, or you can accept it. I think that's pretty pertinent for us this morning. I want to whine about it. And if you'll be honest, you've probably whined about it a little, a little bit too. Do I wish things were different? Absolutely I wish things were different. But they're not. And this is, the, this is what we have to deal with. It's what we have uh, to, to work with. And so first of all, this morning, we need to understand the times that we're living in are times that God has allowed to take place, and He's continuing to work His plan. He's continuing to work His purpose, and He will continue to work His purpose. And the bottom line is, He's put us here for such a time as this. I wasn't born in the 1600s. I wasn't born in the 1800s. I wasn't born in, in, during the Depression. I was born in 1979 in the exact time and the exact place that God wanted me to be born. By the way, that's our vacation Bible school is going to deal with some of that in Samuel's life this year. That he was born at the particular time and place that God chose so that God could fulfill His plan and His purpose. So the first thing this morning is, we need to accept that we're here in this time, and the things that are going on are going on because that God's plan is being fulfilled. And we need to accept that. Go to verse 5. So the first thing is, accept it. Verse 5. After he told them that he had allowed it, 
Here's what he told them to do. So how are we to live? What are we to do? He said in verse 5, Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. The second thought that I want to get out of this, he said, build and plant. Build and plant. Build houses and plant gardens. He said, in other words, don't live in a tent. Don't just throw something up temporarily. He said, settle down. <coughs> and he said, plant a garden. Probably most of us here this morning have a garden planted. That's not the kind of garden he told them to plant. The kind of garden he told them to plant was vineyards and fruit trees. The gardens that we have, what, 60 days? Brother Jerry, 80, 90 days, we're eating out of them, they're gone. The gardens he told them to build were gardens that it would take years for them to come to maturity, for them to eat the fruit of those things. He said, plant them. Invest in these things. Um, I'm going to use my father-in-law for an example. He's 73, 2, 4, somewhere along in there. <laughs> Born in 1948, I believe, so about 73. Uh, last year, he planted a pecan orchard. And when I say an orchard, he planted some, he planted the actual nuts. Others were year old. You know, I like that kind of attitude. Those things, those things will take, what, 10 years to start bearing? And probably another 10 or 20 years before they really start producing uh, in abundance. But you must plan for the future. My dad always, Brother Matt used to say that his dad used, I'm going to have to remember that, I like that, about the Greek word, that, that's good. But I've heard my dad say this a lot of times in preaching. He said that we are to live as if the Lord's coming back today, but we are to plan as if he's coming back a thousand years from now. I've heard him say that. I, I, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard him say that, I'd be a rich man today. Live as if he's coming back today, but, but plan as if his coming is a thousand years from now. Does, does that make sense to you? You look for him today, but you continue to plan. You continue to make uh, arrangements. You know, I've heard people say this, and I'm not casting any reflection on it negatively or positively. You know, the funeral homes have these prearrangement programs. And you could go and you can have all your funeral services and burial paid for up front. A lot of people do that. I've heard some people make the statement, I'm not doing that. The Lord might come back before I die. I'll just have thrown that money away. Well, that's okay. However you want to do it, it's fine. But he said build and plant. Make preparation for the future. So this morning, what are we to do in light of the fact that Evidently, the Lord's coming back pretty quick, pretty soon. Are we just to say, well, I, I'm just going to take it one day at a time. And I'm not going to make any preparation for the future. I'm not going to make any preparation for retirement. I'm not going to make any preparation for things 20, 10 or 20 years. I'm just going to let my house fall, around, fall apart around me. <laughs> is, is that how our, our attitude should be? No, he said build and plant. Let me ask you this, what about as a church? I'm going to be very honest. I believe I see some churches today that have the attitude, you know, the Lord's coming back really quick, we're not going to be here much longer, let's just survive till He gets here. That appears to be the attitude, because I don't see... You know, no investment that's trying to be made in, in the next generation. Nothing being done to, to, to try to plan for the future. Well, you know, 10 or 15 years from now, we're not here anyway. It doesn't matter what we do. How do you know that? We don't know when he's coming back. We need to build and plant. We need to start, th these little ones, we need to start with them early on, teach them. 
Who knows? They may grow up. They may have great grandchildren. It may be 100, 200, 300 years before the Lord comes back. I don't know. We need to invest. And that's what that, I believe he, he's talking about here. Plant gardens. Invest in the future. Keep moving forward. Build and plant. Verse 6. He said, Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and, and not diminished. What was their attitude? Well, we sure don't want to get married and have kids over here. What did God command Adam and Eve to do? Be fruitful and multiply. What are we to do in light of the fact that the world's going more and more wicked and, and you know, do, do I worry about my children? And what they're going to, the world they're going to live in, I, it, it concerns me. It absolutely does. But should that cause us to be so afraid and frightened that we, we choose not to have children? Shouldn't, should it? He said, I don't want you to be diminished, I want you to be increased. What's the best thing for the world right now? It's, it's for Christians to be lights in the world. And the fewer Christians there are, the darker the world's going to be. So you young people that are here this morning, let me encourage you something. Don't be afraid to get married. Don't be afraid to have children. Don't let the, 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 the times that we're in cause you to say, well, we're just going to, you know... We're, we're just not going to uh, have any children because we don't want them to grow up in, in the world that, that we have. No, be fruitful and multiply. And let the Lord take care of our children because He's able to do it. I always think about Noah and his, his boys. Three God-fearing children in the world. That was it. They had no Christian friends. They had nobody that had like values as they did, and yet the Lord blessed, didn't He? And all three of those boys were believers. All three of them got on the ark. If He can do that for Noah's children, He can do it for our children. Be fruitful and multiply. Verse 7. Seek the peace of the city whether I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. There's two things he said that we're to do. What's our attitude toward our society? What's our attitude toward our country? What's our attitude toward our communities? Are we to be against our country? Are we to be against our communities? Are, are, we to try to, uh, are, are we to try to do everything that we can uh, to hinder peace and prosperity in our communities and our country? Absolutely not. He said what we're to do, we're to seek the peace of our city. We're to seek the peace of our community. We're to seek the peace of our nation. The word peace there means the, the health and the prosperity. Not necessarily physical prosperity, but the, the well-being, the welfare. And he said, pray to the Lord for that. Are we to be obstructionists? We see, a lot, of, we see a, a lot, there's a lot of talk about that. I know that we got two political parties and both of them obstruct the other. And I'm glad that, I'm glad sometimes that, some, that one political party obstructs the other. Maybe hinders some things from getting done. But we ought not to be obstructionists just to be obstructionists. Oh, I'm again it. Why are you again it? We need to have a good reason if we're again it. We're to pray for the peace and the well-being 
of our nation, of our community. Notice why. He said, in the peace of it, he said, ye will have peace. Brother Allen, the better country we live in, the better it's going to be for us. We ought to do everything that we can, even in the times that we live in, to make our communities, to make our county, to make our state, to make our country a better place. And then drop down to verse 10. He said, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. When I read this, I thought about James. In the book of James, chapter 5 and verse 7, he said, Be patient, therefore, unto the coming of the Lord. And the example that he used was the husbandman that plants the fruit. He said he plants it, and he waits patiently for that fruit, for that tree to grow up, and it reach a stage of maturity, and then one day for it to bear fruit. He said that's how we ought to be with the return of the Lord. We ought to be patient, be waiting, knowing that he's going to come back, he's going to return, and the thoughts that he thinks toward us are not thoughts, not evil thoughts, but he said that they're thoughts of peace, to give us an end and an expectation, to give us an expected end, something to look forward to. And that's what we have to look forward to today is the return of the Lord. He's not going to leave us here forever. He's going to come back and get us. But until he does... How are we to live in light of the times that we're in? Just what he said. We're to keep pressing on. Keep pressing on. Don't allow fear and worry to cause us to be disobedient to God's will for our lives. Build, plant, be fruitful, multiply, seek the peace, and pray that God will do all of these things. This morning, that's how we're to live in light of the times that we're in. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, the Lord is coming back, and He's going to come back suddenly. He's coming back in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When He comes back, those who are ready, He's going to take with Him. Those who are not ready are going to be left behind. Are you ready today for the Lord to return? Are you looking for it? and expectation, and hope, and joy. He's coming back. You can if you'll trust Jesus as your Savior. Let's, let's have a verse of a song. You have something in your heart this morning.